inscriptions in there which had my eyes popping out. And you could see as it went round the table, you know, people were sort of looking at it under the table and it went round, uh, how far it had got. Uh, it was certainly my feeling that I didn't particularly want anything like that done to me, thank you very much. That would not give me pleasure. But if people were doing it, we had to know they were doing it and we had to know how to advise them to do it safely. Mrs Thatcher promised an explicit campaign and explicit it certainly is. The first campaign in early 1987 was fascinating by the images that were chosen, the direction that it took, which virtually excluded gay men. We had uh, a position where we had very little input into the creation of that leaflet and that campaign. Some advice was sought, but not much. And yet, a leaflet was going to be dropped on every doorstep which had the Terence Higgins Trust telephone number on it. We only found out about this about three weeks before the drop was due to happen. This is a mock-up of uh, the uh, front cover, and as I say, that will be going out uh, to every household in the country just as soon as we can get uh, the uh, post office. The post office can make arrangements for its delivery. And we only had five telephone lines coming into the office at that point. It was truly shocking that the government could go so far um, in putting down a, a leaflet and yet not involve the primary group uh, that was seeing most people with AIDS, with AIDS and HIV at that point um, and not inform us that our number was going to go out to 40 million households. When it did go out, um, British Telecom had a real problem with uh, the exchange in King's Cross, uh, which almost melted down with the number of calls trying to get through. Devised to reach the heterosexual population, the 1987 campaign was regarded in many other countries as a model of its kind in the art of how to inform without giving offence. It was a mirror of Britain's public puritanism, which masks an intense private curiosity about people's sex lives. And this caution would seem almost funny if the effects of this denial hadn't had such a devastating impact on one section of the population. Remember that uh, very soon after that leaflet drop, um, Section 28 uh, was brought in as an amendment which uh, prevented local authorities promoting homosexuality. So there was an issue about how do you uh, promote safer sex for gay men uh, without uh, being charged with promoting homosexuality. And ministers certainly wanted to avoid that. They uh, wanted to uh, be able to justify their actions that this was in the good of the public health in general rather than having the political courage to stand up and say we will invest in uh, safer sex campaigns and safer drug use campaigns uh, for those most at risk because their lives are just as valuable as anybody else's. AIDS is especially difficult to contain because 90% of its victims are homosexual men. For any public health campaign to be effective, it will have to go into intimate details of homosexual sex. And to reach everybody at risk, it must be mounted on such a scale that everyone else, whether they like it or not, will be informed as well. In this film, gay men talk frankly about their sexual lives and whether they've been affected by the first four years of AIDS. This film was never shown to the public. The one attempt to reach nine-tenths of the victims of AIDS was banned. The BBC even destroyed the negative. There was, and still is, a curious hysteria about the subject of men who have sex with men. It's called homophobia. On the basement landing of K-Wing at Wandsworth Jail, five men are being kept in isolation. They're HIV positive, among 57 prison inmates currently identified as having the virus. Now, let's take condoms. If you were to introduce condoms into the prisons, 
I think you would have the effect of encouraging people to do what they wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, both sexual activity and drug taking are against the rules. And it's as almost as if the Home Office is saying, because it's against the rules, the activity doesn't occur. Therefore, we have no problem. This is how AIDS and its method of transmission works on the imagination. The very mention of condoms, when associated with all male institutions, draws the viewer into a whole set of private imaginings. Anonymous shadowy men, starved of female company, practicing the unmentionable. Chairman, on a point of order, would it be an order to describe what it is, in fact, we're debating tonight, the actual act? Because if not, well, we may all know, we may all know, but the chair, would it be in order, that's what the point of order is, would it be in, in order to describe an unnatural act in order that one can be absolutely certain there's no doubt as to outside this house what we're debating? I think the one thing that the British really can't cope with is that concept, simply expressed, buggery. It's also, I mean, it's, it's a funny word. <laughs> it's also a very aggressive word. But actually, that's what people can't cope with. If you're in a bar or something and you get the, you know, the, the, the boys, you know, don't, it'll all be, don't lean over the snooker table, there's gay men in the room. You know, no one ever says, you know, don't expose your nipples, they might nibble them those gay men about. It's buggery. That, that's the act um, that people can't cope with. And exemplified in a perfect way uh, during the Age of Consent debate by uh, Sir Nicholas Fairburn, who hauled himself to his feet. And in a speech which, which was frankly a triumph of gravity over sanity, he used this phrase, heterosexual activity is normal. Yeah. And homosexual a activity, putting your penis into another man's asshole, is a perversion. Order, order, order. We can d well do with that. place erupted, partly in hysteria, partly in shock, but it was so significant because that's what he saw that debate to be about. Not about the right to love, the right to kiss, the right to live together. Not, not about having equal pensions, which is ultimately what it's about, or sharing a mortgage, or all those kind of dull, quotidian things that make up love. He saw it as that single act of which he was clearly terrified. For a long time I was very puzzled. Why did some of my male colleagues feel so frightened of gay men? If they were sure that they were heterosexual, then a gay man could be of no interest to them whatsoever and was no danger. And a number of things then began to creep into my realisation. And I have no particular person in mind as I, as I think this through. One is that some of them probably are gay or might even be bisexual and don't want to be. Really don't want to be. One is that perhaps when they were at school, particularly if they were at some of the old kinds of public schools 30, 40 years ago, perhaps they were attacked. I am grateful, my honourable friend. I am very grateful, my honourable friend. But what my honourable friend is seeking to do is to get this House to vote to legalise the buggery of adolescent males. Does she really think that that's what our constituents have sent us here to do? No. This terror of homosexuality, with all the complicated emotions of denial, blame and private fantasy, finds its most powerful expression in our attitudes towards teenage gay sexuality. In 1985, the BBC commissioned a play from the schools department about two gay teenagers. I'm getting now. <laughs> hey, Bill, Bill. What's your problem? Sharon, know about you and him, does she? Leave it out, eh? <laughs> they delayed showing it for two years and then only showed it at 11.30 at night. It was then delayed for another two years before it was shown to the school's audience for whom it was intended. There was a young man, Matthew, as big as a wall snooker cue. He's made with a lid and black. Reactions to the film were all too typically depressing, I'm afraid. Uh, here's a typical one from the Evening Standard. Um, the pain and the guilt, it says, that will result for, will for many adolescents be devastating. Homosexuality, I imagine, must be a nightmare for its adherents. If it is a state of mind that can be unconsciously learnt, then the power of this film is that it will set a large number of children on a road which may cause them much unhappiness. Well, that's either crocodile tears or 
the man who wrote that is living in a ludicrous Victorian fantasy world that bears no relation to reality. He must have.